So, how many of you have ever built a ride? Prepared a ride? No? So why are you thinking that you want to build your own ride? What are your ideas behind it? Well, for one, I've got a couple that need to be redone. Okay. They've got yeah. they wore the guys out and I just took the guys off of them and I really liked the pole when it was in its former, you know, the way it was when I bought it, but you know, now the guys have gotten so loose and this thread is done. So but I didn't want to throw the rod away because I thought, you know, it'd be a nice rod to redo someday. Right. So it's not so much just building them that you can be repairing your favorite yeah, rod. But I would like to build some too, you know. I've I read a lot of stuff on it how when you make your own rod it's it's more precise than an off-the-shelf rod and you know you can make it to what you want. Right. It's not, you know, if I don't like that rod seat then I can put a different rod seat. You know, if I get partial to the real seat or split grip or whatever then I can go that route with it. Right. That's one of the things that is real nice with this. When you walk into a, a store, a retail store, and you, you pick up a rod, and you always look at it, shake it around a little bit, and, and then you stop and think, well, why, does, why did you put that one back? Was it because you didn't like the real grip, or you didn't like the weight of the rod, or when you held it in your hand, it didn't seem to be quite as balanced as you wanted it to be? <coughs> so being able to build your own rod and design it, you get to decide exactly what it is that you want to put on there. So you might want to, on this rod, you might want to put a wooden grip that you can turn on a lathe. You might want to put just a real small, bare bones type of real seat so that you don't add any extra weight to it. You may want to use just the standard guides that come with a kit. This is actually a kit that we get. Or you might decide, I want to try and make this rod as light as I can possibly make it. So I'm going to go get some titanium recoil guides. I want to put single foot guides on here. I want to put double foot guides. What are the pluses? What are the minuses of those? So I've gone through and I've decided I'm just going to kind of go through the scenario of what I do when I decide what rod I'm going to build or if a customer says, you know, I'd like to get a, a tub of fork finesse rod, three weight, seven foot nine. So I'll grab the rod blank and we'll decide what color. This rod comes in green. It's the only color we have. So then we go through and we pick what color you want those guides to be wrapped in each one of these. Do you want them to stand out? Do you want them to blend in with the rod? One thing I've had a lot of customers say, well, I want all of my guides to be green. I want them to match the rod, but I want that tip to be bright orange or hot pink. Because you can't, I can't tell you how many times I've stepped on that rod and I broke it is what they come in and tell me about it. Or they fish it, maybe they're using it as a trolling, and they just sit there and watch for it to, for that end, and it kind of highlights that a little bit. So that makes that very beneficial. So we decide on what color. We decide on the different type of grip we're going to use. This, is, this just happens to be a fly rod. And we're going to use this grip. And in the kit, it comes with this real seat. But the first thing you want to do and once you have your rod and your blank, is we need to find the spine on the rod. Every rod has a spine, and some rod manufacturers uh, pay attention to that and try and find the spine. Others try and find a natural curve to it. But the best way that I've found is to go ahead and find the spine on a rod. It's just like we have a spine. We can bend over forward, sideways, backwards, but it's a whole lot easier if you drop something to bend over forward. So we want to find the most comfortable position that this rod has to bend to catch a fish. So the way you find that is you take the butt of the rod, lay it on a hard surface, put the top of it in your hand, and give it a little bit of a twist. And as it rolls across the table, I can feel it kind of settle down into a position where it's most comfortable, where it's harder for me to turn it out of that, that position. And that's it right there. So then what I'll do is I'll take this and mark that position, and I'll do that for each section of the rod. So what's going to happen with this, this is the way the rod naturally wants to bend, so when I'm catching a fish, the rod's going to go this way. I had a rod at one point, it was just a little ultralight spinning rod that I bought at Walmart or something, and I was fishing with it, and I'd make my cast, and I'd reel it in, I'd make my cast, I'd catch a fish. Next thing I knew, the top section of that two-piece rod, the guides were sticking out the side of my rod. Well, that's kind of strange. So I <laughs> grabbed hold of it, twisted it back, pushed it together a little bit harder. Made a few more casts, caught another couple of fish, looked up at it, my guides were sticking out the top half or the side of my rod, on the top half of the rod. 
So I quit fishing with the rod. And then when I started learning how to build rods, and I understood what that was, is that when they built that rod, they did not take the time to find that spine, mm -hmm. to, to know exactly where that rod was going to bend. So that is fairly important. Now, if you're building a fly rod or a spinning rod, you want to put your guides on the inside of that spine because that's the way you're going to fish. If you're building a bait caster rod, you want to put your guides on the outside of that because your guides go on the top side and you still want your rod to bend in that natural direction. So that's the only time that you really need to worry about that is with they spinning and a fly it goes on the inside of the spine and on a bait caster it goes on the outside of the top of the rod. So you go through and do that for each one of the pieces. Obviously the smaller the pieces the easier it is to find. And that one's right there. So once you've found all of those, the next step would be find out where each one of the guys are going to go on the rod. And normally from the rod manufacturers or the company that you buy the rod blank from, they have a general guide of where those, those will go on a rod. They spend a lot of time and effort to figure out what's the best placement for each one of those guides. So for example, on this rod, since it already has guides on it, what you might do is tape those guides, mark it on your rod, where each one of those guides go based upon the manufacturer's recommendations. Then take your guides and just tape them on there with masking tape. Then feed some line through your rod, tie one end to chairs, have somebody hold it for you and make it pretend like you have a fish on there. And then you look at that line as it goes through each one of those guides and you look for any type of kinks or any area where there's too much, uh, there's too much space in between those two guides and you wind up with a, like a little bit of a belly of a rod of the line. Then you can take that and you can move those guides before you actually put them on there until you get that actual bend that you're looking for in that line so that it actually follows the rod blank instead of uh, hanging down below or having too much gap in between there for when you cast it. Is it possible to have too many guides on a rod and how it, would you know? It is possible to have too many guides on there. Normally when you purchase a rod, especially if it comes in a kit, it comes with a number of guides that they suggest it to be there. Uh, if you get too few guys, then you've got too much of a gap in there and your line's too far away from your rod. It's actually hanging way down below your rod. If you put too many guides on it, you actually add extra weight to it. And by adding extra weight to it, for example, for a fly rod, um, it can make that fast rod be much slower because now you've got all that extra weight nine foot out, out there and you're, when you're making that cast, it has that extra weight where it has to actually drag it all the way through that process. Now you can, if you're trying to go for a lighter fly rod, if you want to build it as light as you possibly can, you would go and get the lightest guide you can. Uh, we would probably use single foot guides because that's, if you use a double foot guide that comes with this kit, I'm putting two individual sections of thread and then I'm also putting two coats of epoxy, one on each side for each one of those guides. So that's going to add extra weight to it. So with a single guide, I've added less weight from the guide in probably grams, but I've also added less weight from thread and epoxy. So you can make a rod much lighter. And that's one of the things with these rods is when somebody picks them up, it's just kind of incredible how light they actually are. The, the way that they're their design from the manufacturer and the amount of epoxy and thread that, that you can put on there. So once you get the guides, and we've marked on that, that rod based upon either the manufacturer's guidelines or you've gone through and you've looked at it and you've reallocated where those guides are going to go, I'm just going to tape a couple of these on here real quick. And then we'll, I'll show you how can wrap those on there. If you think of any questions, please ask while we're going through this. What are some recommended places to buy the rod blanks? Buy the rod blanks. Uh, some of the suppliers I use, I use Mudhole. They're out of Florida. Uh, there's Jan's Netcraft. Rod Geeks is a company uh, in Mexico. You can also buy blanks through St. Croix. A lot of the rod manufacturers will allow you to buy the blanks directly from, uh, from their local. There, there's a place in, uh, on Manchester Road that you can also buy them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? 
Feathercraft and also uh, Hargrove. What is it? Hargrove's Fly Shop. It's right down the street from them. But uh, I also uh, can supply you with any blanks if you're looking for something special. Turn this around. What, what kind of material is that one you have there? What type of material? Yeah. Graphite. What about following the rod seat or the the guides? What's the purpose in that, and do you have to do it? Following the number that they have. Filing the guides. Filing it down. The reason for that would be, I was going to show you that with this one. A lot of the usually the stripper guide or on some of the bait casters, the the first two or three guides, they have a little bit thicker lip on them. So an example of that would be this is the rod, this is the guide. And when you put the thread on your rod, it would be try and get that thread up on top of that guide or my finger without skipping any spaces. So what we do with that is we take the end of the guide and with the Dremel tool being really careful not to hit any part of the ring because if we nick that, that can cause damage to the line when we're fishing. But just trying to get that end of that nose kind of ramped down a little bit so that the thread can jump up on that foot a little bit better. Every once in a while you'll also have one of just the regular standard guys that might have a little burr on it and as you're wrapping you're continually fraying your thread. So at that point what you might do is take a little fingernail file or emery board and just hit that very lightly and it, it takes that off pretty easily. What's, so, uh, Is there a specific size thread or is all rod building thread pretty much the same size? There's a size A and a size D. And I usually use size A thread for most of the rods that I build. Size D is usually used on the coast for the deep sea rods. Um, easiest way to remember that when I teach it is I can tell my students what grade you want to earn in this class. A. So it's an easy way to remember that. Um, another thing though, you've got the, the cork handle, or if you choose to use EVA or a wood handle, a lot of times when you buy this, it doesn't fit just right. And in that case, what you would have to do is they have a tool called a reaming tool. It's basically uh, a little rod that has sandpaper on it, and then you would ream the inside of that out to make it fit. So getting into rod building can be a little expensive to start with if you go out and get all the toys. But if you have a rat tail file that's the right size, you can do that too. It might just take a couple extra twists to get it through there. <coughs> There's videos where guys make their own. Right. Super epoxy, some sandpaper, Super old pole, really. Mm -hmm. I just use that. And another thing with the uh, reel seat, a lot of times the inside of the reel seat doesn't quite fit this exactly. There's quite a bit of movement inside of there. So what you can do with that is take some masking tape and build up little arbors so that it fits real nice and snug. Now you don't want to get it real tight though, because if you imagine you're going to put epoxy over the top of this masking tape, and you want to seal that masking tape completely, just in case any water would get down in your reel seat, you want to make sure that masking tape stays dry. Because you don't want it to fall apart, get all nasty and moldy, and have your rod fail just because masking tape got wet. I've had some people ask me too, you just really all you use is masking tape on there? That's all you need to use as long as you seal it completely with epoxy because it will never get wet and it will basically never see the light of day. So you just kind of work through it a little bit too snug, take off just a couple layers and you just want to have it fairly snug but as I was saying you're going to coat this in epoxy and you don't want it to be so tight that you can imagine it squeegeeing all the epoxy off of that tape. So we'll assume that we've figured out where the, the spine is on each one of these pieces and we've got a line drawn on it. Okay, so that fits pretty well. That fits good. Don't have a, any movement in there. So then what I'll do is I'll take and I'll mix up a, a two-part epoxy. I use a paste epoxy because it doesn't drip. It doesn't make a mess and I'll completely seal that masking tape, get some on the rod here, and I'll usually make a little bit of a mark 
on my rod so I know how far up I can get that epoxy. And this is just a little china marker so it rubs off real easy. So I'll coat it real well with epoxy and then I'll twist this as it goes on. Make sure it gets spread out really well. And then the same thing with this, I'll put a real thin coat of epoxy right almost all the way up to my little white mark that I made. And then as I push this down, I'll twist it to make sure that it's spreading, out, spreading it out real well. <coughs> Excuse me. Then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look in here and I'm going to see where my reel is going to sit. And that's going to be the bottom side of my rod. So I need to make sure that my spine mark is on the bottom side of the rod aligned with that. So I'll watch down the end of it here to make sure it's lined up real well, make sure everything's real nice and tight, and then I'll set it over in the corner <clears throat> and just let the epoxy dry. I use a 15 minute epoxy, but I usually try not to mess with it for a good 30 minutes just to be on the safe side. If you get epoxy anywhere on the rod that it doesn't belong or on your hands, the magic epoxy remover is Germax. It takes it off like you would not believe. I've had students that they just made a mess and had it all over the real seat and they were all upset and just walked right over there with a towel, wiped it off, and the leg was never there. So keeping that in mind, make sure you don't get any Germax up there where you want the pieces to stick. All right, so that's going to sit over there and it's going to dry. So the next thing I would do is I would place all of my guides, line them up size-wise, largest to the smallest, all the way up to the end, and tape each one of those guides in place on my rod. If I'm going to work with my rod right away, I'm making sure that I would place my guide right, the center of my guide right over the top of where I marked it based upon the, the specifications, and I would tape both sides and then run the line through it, make sure everything's lined up real nice. Once I've done that, I'm ready to start wrapping my guides on. This is a really nice setup to have, but you don't need all these little bells and whistles to do it. You can use a block of wood that has a V cut into it, and then you use your spool thread, you stick it in a coffee cup, and then you grab a great big thick book. And if you want more tension, you bury that thread, you take your piece of thread and feed it through the book. And if you need more tension, you bury it deeper into the book where you put another book on top of it. And the reason you put your spool in the cup is just to keep it from rolling on the floor. And then you can just use a block of wood and, and build your rod. So you just take the thread. I don't know if you guys want to come up any closer where you can actually see. You're welcome to do that. And you start it on your guide. Let's do this one because that guide might need to be ground down a little bit. What I do is I take three wraps of thread and I just wrap it around the rod. And then I'm going to push those threads over and then I'm going to take, this is the tag end and this is the terminal end, and take this terminal end and wrap it over the top of that tag end and just start wrapping it around the rod. Pushing it together real nice and tight. Now they also make electric ones where it's got a little foot pedal and once you get it to this point all you have to do is push the foot pedal and it will keep going until you tell it to stop up there. Now what works really well to cut your thread tight or close are these little cuticle nippers. I'm going to wrap it up part of the way there. Then I'm going to grab another piece of thread of a different color. And this is a little pull-through loop. I'm going to set that in the rod, or on the rod, and wrap over the top of it with the loop facing the guide, the direction I'm wrapping toward. Put five, six wraps or so over the top of it. I'm going to cut that off. I'm going to take that little thread that I was using to wrap the guide, put it through the loop. Pull it back through, pull everything real nice and tight, trim it off. And there's one wrap. 
So you continue to do that all the way through your rod, trying to make sure that you still keep your guides lined up on that spine, unless you're building one of the rods that has the twist to it that a lot of people use for trolling. Once I get it, the first guide on, I take a look at it, make sure everything's lined up right. Maybe I need to adjust this one before I start putting the thread on it. It's a whole lot easier to adjust it while the masking tape's on it. Get that all lined up and then start wrapping this guide. The other thing you have to do is you have to wrap the ferrules. On each one of the rod sections, the bottom part of the rod needs to be wrapped because this other section is going to up inside of there and after years and years of using it, taking it apart, putting it together, it could possibly cause that graphite to splinter. So by putting a wrap on there, and in some cases some of the rod lengths have a little bit of a gray area in there, I usually cover that whole gray area. But I want to make sure that however wide that little gap is in there, I want to make sure that my thread wraps are at least that wide. So if this is a quarter of an inch across, I want to make sure that my wrap up here is a quarter of an inch across to help strengthen that end so that when I'm taking the rod apart and putting it back together, it helps ensure that that's not going to break. So you do that for each one of those. Usually the last thing I put on is the tip. So I've got my whole rod finished. I haven't put the, the epoxy on it yet, but I'm going to put my, the rod tip on. And what I actually use is I just use a little bit of glue stick. Just regular Walmart glue stick. And I cut little bitty shavings off of it with a razor blade and with little bitty skinny pieces and I drop it down inside of there and I try and fill it as best as I can. And then what you do is you take, usually if I'm using a fly tip or anything that's silver or any color other than black, I'll use an alcohol burner rather than a lighter because this lighter will actually turn this a little bit black. An alcohol burner will burn much cleaner and it won't discolor this. So we'll pretend I've got my glue sticking out of there. I would just light it up from the bottom here and watch for it to melt, being real careful to notice that this little ring will eventually get hot. And then I'll hurry up and put it on my rod, making sure again that it's lined up with the spine and with all the rest of my guides. And then once that cools, it's on there temporarily. So that what that gives me now is it gives me the opportunity to wrap this little section right up here at the top, whether I'm going to wrap it in the bright color or I'm going to continue to go with the color I'm using on the rod. The only purpose that wrap right there is serving is more of a cosmetic. You can really just see that it's there and you know where the tip of your rod is. So I'll start in this case, I'll start at the end of the tip and work my way down because that gives me the opportunity to push it up there real nice and tight up against there. Then if I did not do the next step, this thing could be sitting in the back window of your car or your truck in the summertime. If the sun beat down on it, you get back in your truck, and the next thing you know, the tip is facing down and all your guys are facing up. So what you need to do with that is while you're putting the epoxy or the finished coat over the top of your threads, you want to put about an eighth to a quarter of an inch of epoxy up over the top of that guide. It serves a couple purposes, now it's not going to fall off. Never had a guide fall off of a ride yet. However, if by chance you were to break your rod, all you would need to do is take a little razor blade, take that epoxy off of it, heat it up to remelt that glue, and now you've got your guide to use on either another rod or it may fit down just a little bit depending on how much is broken off. So that's all it takes for that tip section. So then, once you've got your rod completely finished, you may decide that you want to put a trim band on it might want to add just a little bit of an accent color around there. There's lots of different ways to do it, but the best way that I found is use a drinking straw or a little stirring straw for our coffee. And you take that and you tape it to your rod with the open side of that straw facing toward the guide that you want to put that accent on. Pull off 10 or 12 inches or so, whatever your accent color is that you want to use. And then you wrap that around the straw and the rod. Normally, I only uh, the minimum I'll do is four wraps. The maximum I'll do maximum I'll do is seven. Now you're breaking the bobber stuff. Mm -hmm. 
put that together and basically use this little straw here to tie a nail knot. It helps if you cut that off straight too if it's not frayed. Mm -hmm. And then feed the other one through the other direction. All I'm doing is feeding it right between the rod and that straw. I'm not going in the straw, I'm just going right between the two. It's just serving the purpose of, of giving me a little bit of room to be able to slide that thread between the two. And then slide it down to where you want it. Now, another thing I'll think about every time I put a knot on here is what type of rod is this? And when I'm fishing with it, which side of the rod am I going to see? This might be a little bit OCD, but <laughs> I might see that knot while I'm fishing once I cut all that off. So I'm going to actually turn my knot and put all of my knots either on the side of the rod or on the bottom of the rod, the side that is going to be toward the lake. We'll let the fish watch that little bitty knot. So what I'm doing is just pulling it real nice and tight. And then again, I'm going to use these little nippers and I'm going to cut it as close as I possibly can. You can also use a razor blade, but these little nippers work well. You can use a uh, pair of fingernail clippers. And then now we've got this nice little accent. That can be any color of thread. It can be a metallic thread. It just looks nice, gives it that little bit of extra. Some of the heavy duty rods that they use for deep sea fishing, they'll actually sometimes do a complete thread base underneath of the guide before they put it on, and then they'll put them a coat of epoxy on it, and then they'll put the guides on, then they'll put the wraps, and they'll put another coat of epoxy on it. What that does is it gives them a really nice look underneath of there. It looks like it's really finished. You can also do decorative wraps. If you go out and you go to YouTube or Google decorative wraps or go to Custom Rod Builders Guild's website, and they just go crazy. You can do, there's one fellow out there that does uh, weaving, and he has done a weaving of uh, Elvis. He's done all four of the Beatles on one fishing rod. It's just crazy how, how truly customized you can make these rods. <coughs> so once we get it all finished, what we'll do is we'll take it, we'll put it together. And while you're building it, you don't want to cram this thing together. You just want to put it together so that it won't fall apart. And then right before you start putting the finish on it, we want to take another look. And we're going to pretend that I've got all the guides on here and the tip. And I'm going to eyeball this thing. I'm going to look one more time and make sure that all the way down the rod, all of my guides are lined up. Just by kind of eyeballing it like this. And you may find that one of those guides is off just a little bit. And even though you've got thread on both sides of those, or if you're using a spinning rod, you can usually move it just a little bit. You can, I try not to, but I have had to move a couple of students around by about a quarter inch, or about a quarter of the, the distance around the rod. So the goal is just to look down the rod. You may set it on a surface and look down <coughs> and look for the top of each guide and make sure that everything's real nice and lined up really well. But then what you would do, <coughs> you need some way to keep this rod turning for the next six, seven hours. So you can put it back in your little blocks or you can put it in whatever you want to use. <coughs> About every 10 minutes, walk over to it and give it a turn. <coughs> and come back to it and give it another turn. Or you can buy a a rod dryer or you can use a rotisserie motor and build your own. Just something to hold the end of that rod that allows the rod to continue to turn for about six hours while it dries. Because when we put the epoxy on, we use a two-part epoxy. I use Procoat brand. I've used Flexcoat before. Just Procoat seems to give you a little bit longer life as you're putting it on your rod. <coughs> I think the optimum temperature is something like 82 degrees. So if you can stay in working in your, your shop at 82 degrees, it's a really good temperature to put the epoxy on. If you mix it by hand, make sure you don't mix it with wood. A little piece of wood holds air, and it can put air bubbles in your epoxy. Don't use a straw. Use something that's non-porous. Use maybe a, uh, the back of a little plastic brush, 
and stir it very slowly. Don't whip it up, don't take your brush in and out. Stir it slowly. Or you can get a little, looks like a little concrete mixer. And it has a little ball bearing that sits down at the bottom of it. You take your two-part epoxy and you squirt it in there. And this has to be really precise. You normally measure it with a syringe, making sure that you get exactly 50-50. Because at some point, if you don't get it exactly 50-50, your epoxy may never dry. And if that happens, you can go back and put a second coat of epoxy on it. Just a real thin coat of epoxy on it that second time, and that will seal the top of it. So you let it mix for a while, and when all those color or when those uh, chemicals are mixed together, you take it and you put it on with a little brush. <coughs> and as you're doing that, no matter how hard you try, you're still going to get a couple air bubbles in there. So you use a little. You can use a lighter. You can use a little alcohol burner, and you just barely get it close to it or barely touch it to heat that up. It will burn. If you get it too hot, your threads will burn and they'll pop off, so you just have to be real careful with that. But what you're doing is you're just heating up that chemical mix and you're causing it to get a little bit thinner and you'll actually have a little bit dripping off. I tell my students, if it's not dripping off, you're not putting enough on. So I want them to take that brush and I want them to very carefully, without adding air bubbles, grab a glob, put it right over the threads, grab another glob, put it right over the threads, take that little alcohol torch, heat it up just a little bit, and let it drip back in the cup and use it. And as it's dripping back off, it's almost giving you the exact amount of epoxy that you need. And then if there's just a little bit of a drip left on there, take that brush and just drag it across the side. Do that for the entire ride. You can usually, for a nine foot fly ride, you can plan maybe an hour to an hour and a half to do the whole ride. And you may find that you have to mix up two batches of epoxy. If your epoxy starts getting thick and gummy, stop because it will just, you will not be happy with what you get. Go ahead and take the time, mix up another batch. If this is your first ride and you're doing a great big ride or you've got lots of uh, long wraps, mix up half of what you think you need and then mix up the second half to do the second half of the ride rather than trying to get it to stretch out there. And Because by the time you get to that tip section, if it's all gummy, it's going to dry not smooth at all. We won't be real happy with it. And then I usually try not to fish with it. I know it's real hard not to grab hold of it and bend it and flip it around and get out there and play with it for 72 hours. That's what I usually try to do. Procoat is a very flexible epoxy. And they say you can fish with it as soon as it's dry. But it still seems a little tacky or a little gummy up to about 24 hours. To the point where I wouldn't want to put it in any type of a case for 24 hours to so plan ahead. If you're going to build a ride to go fishing for the weekend, try and plan ahead. Um, and I've just noticed in, in the rods that I've built, maybe, um, maybe it's just me or maybe it's because I built it, I think they're, they feel a whole lot more sensitive. Uh, I can feel the bite. Um, the one rod that we have outfished the other two rods in the boat, six fish to none in a matter of about an hour and a half. The next year we went back, those other two people had built the exact same ride that, that I had, and we just had a blast. Hmm. Not saying it's going to happen every time, but it, it, it's a little bit of really cool satisfaction to, to catch a fish on something that you built. And if you do fly fishing, it's really something cool to catch a fish on the fly you tied on the ride you bought, or on the rod that you built. It's that, that really little bit of satisfaction that, hey, this really does work, and the fish really really thought that what they were eating was right. I was smarter than today. That's right, today. Well, what about tomorrow? <laughs> we'll both come back and see that one. So what other questions do you guys have for me? Do you epoxy the threads that are going in the ferrules? Yes, they go right over the top of the ferrule. And I'll come back there to show you so you can see. On this, what I do, so you can kind of see this here. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind, of, kind of dull. I'll try and start at my thread right about there, and then I'll take it back, usually to cover this up. Sometimes on the rod length, so they come all the way back to here, and sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. It just has to be at least as wide as that is. And then I'll take the epoxy and I'll get it right up there to the edge. Okay. So just don't go over, just right to the edge. Right. So what, 
do that and let it dry then before you put you do the rest of the rod? I just I start at the end and work my way up. So I'll start down there at the very end. If I'm going to put a hook keeper on it right there by the grip, that's where I'll start putting my epoxy on. And then I'll move up to the next ferrule because that's usually what you find if you have a couple piece rod, like four piece rod. Then I'll move up and I'll start epoxying this guide. Then I'll move to this side. And as I'm doing each one, I'm still heating it up just a little bit to get those air bubbles out of there. But you then don't I'm, put it together though. Mm -hmm. I put it together, but I'm real careful not to get the epoxy down on that other section of the rod. So when I've got these two pieces of rod together and I'm putting my epoxy on, I'm taking my brush and I just use little throwaway brushes. They're like oh, okay, eight cents a piece. And I I'm going to put the, the threads were going on the inside, no. but they're on the outside. Yeah, they okay. just go on the side here, and I'll get it as close as I can. Now, what happens if just by chance I get it on that other piece of the rod? What's the first thing I'm going to grab? Germex. Germex. I'm going to pull that apart. I'm going to hit that really good with Germex. I'm going to put this back down a little bit while the Germex is still a little bit wet because there may be some epoxy up underneath of there, and just twist it a little. Then I'm going to pull it back out again. I'm going to wipe it one more time with Germex, then wipe it off, then I'm going to put it back together, and I'm going to go to the next section. Now, what happens if you don't find out until after you're finished and you go to pull your rod apart? There's just a little bit left. Real careful without getting a whole lot of Germex up here. Put it on down here, kind of rub it in a little bit. And you may have to add after that has dried really well, if you can't get it to come apart, don't do it while the Germex is still wet. You may need to add a little bit of heat to it. And by heating that up a little bit, it's usually enough to break it free. And when you're pulling your rod apart, don't pull it this way. Twist and pull. Twist and pull. And don't get in the habit of using your guides as leverage. Yeah, keep them apart. If you've got a rod that's really stuck together like that, you can grab two arrow pullers and pull it like that. Or you can also take it behind your legs and use your legs to pull it apart. Uh, we've had that problem before where we've gone fishing early in the morning before the sun came up and then it got warm throughout the day and it kind of expanded and it took forever to get that right apart, but we did. And he knows not to shove it together that, mm -hmm. that hard anymore. Uh, so, sits and turns for six hours, then you patiently wait another couple, another day or two before you actually go out and fish with it. And uh, always make sure you take the plastic off of your grip no matter what type of rod you have, because water will get up underneath there and it'll get moldy and nasty and make your cork fall apart. Other questions? One thing that you'd asked me about earlier, and I don't do this on all my rods, there's two schools of thought. This particular rod is spinning rod. I started down here and I worked my way up to the guide, but I also put a couple wraps up behind it. Some rod builders seem to think that that helps keep that single foot guide on there because there's that little bit back there behind it. And some people will actually take a couple thread wraps and go around the guide this way and then back down on there. Um, not to jinx myself, but no matter how we've done it, we've not had any fall off. Since this was a little bit heavier rod, I decided to go ahead and put a little bit on the back of it just as an extra precaution just to make sure. And some people feel more comfortable that that is back there. There are a couple of store-bought rods. I can't remember the name brands right off the top of my head, but they will put some of it on there. And also some of the name brand rods, if you look really close on their rods, this is actually five wraps of gold thread on here. Their rods, they take paint, and they'll paint a little gold mm -hmm. rib on it. Um, but you can do olive leaf patterns in here. You can switch if you're so inclined to want to go only halfway up this guide and you want to switch colored threads at that point, you can do that. Because once the thread's on there, once the epoxy's on there, that's, that's what's going to hold that rod and keep the strength with it. And what's the, the difference between using the, like the graphite item sticks and fiberglass? Because I see that you can buy fiberglass planks too. You can. They're, Completely different action. I've never actually fished with a fiberglass rod before. It's a lot slower action. Is it? I don't think I've used them. Mainly for crankbaits. It's about all you can ever use them for. I mean, that's all I ever use them for. I use graphite for everything else. But, well, the crank, well, the, the fiberglass rod, 
when you get a bite, it has a little bit more forgiveness so that fish actually gets more of that fish or that bait in its mouth before you actually, it loads up differently is okay. maybe what it is. So it's that's like fishing like, with a softer Yeah, softer that's bread. what she said. Fish is totally different because it is. I mean, it's, that's the pole I want to build. It's, a, it's an old fiberglass rod, mm -hmm. you know, and it was a crankbait rod and I loved it. It threw good and everything, but now it's sitting in my basement, two pieces. <laughs> And no matter what they say, you can never have enough rods. Yep. Just look in my basement. <laughs> Other questions? Can you think of? Is that uh, rod thing you got there? Is that is that a production deal? Or is that just a piece off of one that you had? This is you buy it as a uh, complete set. The other four foot of it or so has a motor on the end of it. Yeah. And it does two things. It will automatically, when you hit that pedal, it will spin you around <coughs> you, and then you can flip a switch and that. it actually switches it over so that it can dry. So you can get by with just buying one thing, yeah. but this piece is fairly expensive all the way buying the motor and everything. And I find something to think about if you are thinking about buying something like this. If you're going to do fly rods or you're going to do seven foot rods or eight foot rods or ten foot rods, whatever you're going to do, the motor is down there, and you're up here, and the motor only goes forward with your foot. So if you need to back your rod off, back a little bit of that thread off, you've got to roll your chair all the way down to the other end and turn that wheel backwards. So I find myself using just this section more than I do the motor section. If I'm building a short spinning rod, where I'm only a foot away, it's not a big deal. I can reach down there and just spin it backwards. Where with this one, it, forward and backward, I just I like this. You you can buy some setups for just just this portion of it, mm -hmm. a lot less expensive. But it's also um, it's still expensive because the uh, market's driving the price. It's really cool to have. Mm -hmm. So if you really want it, you'll pay a lot of money. But what I use at school when I teach, we use the wooden blocks with a V cut in it. Or we've got a couple other uh, setups that uh, has a little bit of a spring action of a piece of wire that has some give to it, which constantly gives you tension. Versus if you just have a, as I mentioned earlier, if you've got the wooden blocks and you've got a cup and a book, if you roll backwards, that thread's just kind of kind of spool off of it. Right. And you always want to keep tension on that, otherwise it's just going to spool off on you. What about a furnishing tool? Do you ever use a furnishing tool or just use your nail? I use the back side of a razor blade. Okay. So you find that just the hand wrapping is better than the using the power? I find it's easier for me. But you have to have the power for the dryer anyway. Right. Or you can build your own with a rotisserie motor and not worry about the nice thing about you, you can build your own with a sewing machine motor. That's what I did. What I did on mine is I just I took a a rheostat and I can either I can turn wide open or I can turn down to eight RPMs a minute and then I can also flip switch just like you do on the ones you buy and I still got the foot pedal offer so machine that I use on it. It's real nice, like I said, if you're using a short wrap. Once you get it started, you've got five six wraps on it. And if it's got this little carriage on it, this little carriage basically moves along with it. Mm -hmm. So you can hit the pedal and it will wind it up to where you want to stop and where you want to put your little pull-through loop so you can tie your knot on it. Then you hit that pedal again and you stop it at the, the foot, at the end of the foot, and you, you're finished. But like I said, it's kind of hard to, I was telling the guys that make them, I said, you guys need one that, that has a neutral where you can hit a button with your foot yeah, and it allows you to go both directions with mm -hmm. that. They just said, don't make any mistakes, and you won't have to go backwards. I said, Everybody makes mistakes. That's right. Okay. How many, I guess it doesn't matter, is it a length that you do as far as the wraps go, or is it a certain amount of wraps? It, it's usually the length. Usually what I try and do, well, I guess it's a combination of I try to get at least five wraps on the rod before I start going up the foot. But then I have some students that say they really like the colors. It's your rod. How yep. do you want to build it? Yep. Taking into consideration, if you make that rod wrap this long, you're going to have that much more weight plus all the epoxy, so that rod's going to act differently. 
but this is your route. If that's what you want, yeah. then that's fine. <coughs> Just things to think about. Have you done any marbleization or anything like that? I have. Does that make the rod act different too? It's usually on the this oh, far yeah, down. Usually doesn't like go. Up, got to do. Yeah, it usually doesn't go up too much past this. Yeah. So you've got it mostly down at the butt section, so you don't feel a whole lot of difference in it. But when you get out to those deep sea rods, it's basically fishing with a broomstick. They'll marbleize underneath of each one of the guides when they've got that mm -hmm. big double foot guide on there, and they've got that really nice marbleization going on under there, and they've got it here. And they might only do it maybe the first three <coughs> guides up because they don't want to add all that extra weight all the way out to the end. But by the time they've got those big roller guides on there, you know, we've already added 20 pounds of the raft. <laughs> so I'm exaggerating a little bit. A couple thousand dollars of epoxy. That's right. That's right. Uh, do both those places over there sell rod bills and stuff? Feathercraft and other places? They do. Can you say that other ones right down the road for Feathercraft? Because I've never seen that bit of Feathercraft. Mm -hmm. Like I said, if there's anything you're looking forward to, I can always, I have quite a bit of back style since they teach classes and things like mm -hmm. that, so. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. Thank Hope you enjoyed it. All right. Thank you. I just got to jump and do it. That's right.